So let me ask you this question, and don't answer out loud. What is the scariest movie you've ever seen? Don't answer out loud. Take a moment. Hmm. What would it be? My scary movie. This is for me. It's Ernest Scared Stupid. (laughs) That was rude. This is my scary movie. You might think it's funny. I'll tell you what's funnier. In church life, I was 30 when I got married, so I was single up until then. And I guess everybody in church thought, well, you're single. You have nothing to do. Why don't you babysit my kids? And uh, yeah, that was fun. So I got to babysit some kids. And I remember, I said, let's watch a movie. Ernest Scared Stupid. I loved Ernest Goes to Camp, Goes to Jail, Saves Christmas. He's, he's just scared stupid. So let's watch this movie. And we watched the movie, and I'll tell you, you get a phone call from a dad of an eight-year-old when you're in your early 20s and said, you let my son watch Ernest Scared Stupid? I'm like, oh, yeah, it's great. I wish they'd make a part two. And he said, well, let me just tell you this. He hasn't slept in his bed in a couple days. <laughs> Remember, I'm in my 20s. I'm like, so? Okay, yeah. And then it hit me. I got scared. Terrified. I was so scared because I thought I was going to lose my job. I really did because that dad was my boss. (laughs) One of my best friends. His son's now in his 20s in college and still brings that up. (laughs) And now that I've got little kids, they're like, hey, I can't wait for them to watch this movie to scare your kids. I was like, oh, great. You may not know this, but the Bible is full of all kinds of stories. I mean, it's got love stories. Oh, It's got action stories, spy stories, suspense stories, even scary stories. And Jesus was the greatest storyteller of all times. And he told one of the scariest stories and just a few words. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to John chapter 10. Listen to this as I read it. I tell you the truth, anyone who sneaks over the wall of the sheep, of the shepherd, must be a thief or a robber. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, when I read that, let's be honest, that's not as scary as some stories. Not even as scary as what the crazy people in Hollywood are doing. No. Especially not as scary as Ernest Scared Stupid. But this story from Jesus is scary. Here's why. Because it's true. It's true. Things that are true are way scarier. Kind of like when you see police lights in your rearview mirror. It's pretty scary. Some of you are probably comfortable with that. That's a problem. We don't have a class for it, but we should. It's called slow down. <laughs> Maybe you get that phone call. I'm like, I'm sorry. Your identity has been stolen. Oh, no. Oh, here's one. The ring doorbell. For all amazing things the ring doorbell can do, it goes off at one in the morning. No one's there. You had that. Bloop, bloop. You get notified. Someone's at your door and, and you go down there and you don't see anybody. You watch the footage back and you're like, there's no one there. And then you and your spouse are like, we're moving. And then you come to find out, oh, daddy, it's the neighbor's cat. <laughs> and it's black. And then you're really moving. <laughs> Things that are true are scarier. How about you hear a little water in the wall? And the next thing you know, you don't have a kitchen or a bathroom or a stay. It just doesn't matter. And it's like $15,000 worth of repairs and everybody's slow to fix it. Yeah. You see, unlike the boogeyman, there's a real enemy out there to get you. His goal is to steal from you. Think about that. To steal from you, to take what God has given you from birth. His goal is to kill you, to take your life if he can. 
His goal is to destroy you, to make sure your eternity is not spent with God, Mm -mm. but it's bent on hell. How many of you know that God has a plan for your life? Do you know that Satan has a plan for your life? Mm -hmm. Jesus tells us clearly what Satan's plan is for your life because Jesus knows. Satan's plan for your life is to kill, steal, and destroy. But the story of Jesus, it tells us something else. It tells us about an enemy, but it tells us more importantly about who Jesus is because there's a real enemy out there to get you. But there's a real Jesus who wants to love you and care for you, and wants to see you have your best. Look at John 10 again. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who sneaks over the wall of the shepherd's fold, rather than going through the gate, must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, to fully get this story, you have to understand a little bit of the background here. This is the in-between-the-lines stuff that Jesus would tell to his audience that we might not know because we don't raise sheep. Well, we don't raise sheep like they did back in Jesus' day. Back then, there was all different kinds of people, all kinds of people in the town who own sheep. And instead of each person having their own pen, Here's what they would do. They would all have one pen and they put all the sheep in that one pen in the town. And then they'd hire a guy. they say, hey, I'm going to hire you and you're going to come watch the sheep at night so I can get some sleep. And the next day, each of the sheep owners would come up, talk to the guy they hired and call out their sheep by name. And then they'd take their sheep to the countryside and let them have a great time and a good time and do what sheep do and eat and play and flock through the land. And then they'd bring them back into the town and put them back into the pen. That's what they did. Let me explain it a little different because maybe you don't own sheep. It's kind of like when you park your car and you use valet parking. It's kind of like when you go to child care and you check your, you give them your child and they give you a little ticket and you're like, wait a minute, this doesn't add up, but you'll keep my child safe. It's kind of like this. Maybe you have a community fridge at work. You might have a community fridge at work. Uh-huh, those dreaded community fridges. We have one here. It's a blast. <laughs> I could write a book about it. And maybe you put your own name on all of your Tupperware. You're like known to have labels, to make labels and put it on your Tupperware. You're that person. And then there's that one jar of unidentified liquid and you're like... I'm not touching that. Like in our community fridge, it's my favorite thing because we are very systematic and Hillary has her spot and no one takes her spot. And I like to be like, nope, we're going to move this around. And we have this one little jar that we don't know what it is, but Jackie says we cannot throw it away or the fridge won't work. So we leave it in there. (laughs) Respect my elders. I trust her. (laughs) Look at verse three. Look at verse three. It says, then the gatekeeper opens up the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him and calls his own sheep by the name and leads them out. Jesus is telling the story about sheep. They're all huddled together. So imagine this. You've got Mr. Smith's sheep right here. And then right over here, you've got Mr. Thompson's sheep. They're right there. They're all of them are all together. And each day the shepherd, he'd come out He'd talk to the hand, and the hand would open the gate, and the shepherd would call out the sheep by name. By name. Here, Fluffy. Come here, Wooly. Ernest, get over here. Come here, buddy. But if the shepherd tried to call a sheep that he didn't know, ooh, that sheep would just look at him and go, that's a bad idea. (laughs) Come on. That's pretty funny. You have to use, do a sheep joke if you're talking about sheep. The sheep would be like, I don't know you. Who are you? And wouldn't come out at all. Mm -mm. Look at verse 5. They wouldn't follow a stranger. They would run from him. Because they didn't know his voice. This entire month we've been in a series called Parables. We're looking at the stories of Jesus. We call them parables. By the way. And we ask this question often. 
Because each of these stories is a way for Jesus to tell about himself and what heaven's like. These stories tell us what this reality, how it invades that reality. So here's the question we need to ask ourselves about the passage of John 10. What does this story tell us about Jesus? What does it tell us about Jesus? It's an important question to ask because each and every one of us in this room, whether you're watching online, we all have fears. We do. We all have fears. There's something that scares us, whether you're going to admit it or not. And Jesus wants you to know, hey, he has the answer to your fears. Some of you are sitting there, I don't have any fears. You're afraid of being afraid. And Jesus says, hey, I have the answer to your fear. So if you're taking notes, if you're writing this down, I want you to get your hand out. out. The first thing I want you to write down is this. When you're afraid, you're lost. Jesus wants to give you direction. He wants to give you direction. To give you direction. I'm jealous of people who just have like, who know how to get places. It wasn't up until the iPhone until I knew where I was going. And I'm not, that's not a joke. That's just the truth. It's the first thing I do. I pray, then I pull out my GPS. I, I just, that's just how God wired me. But sometimes we feel lost in life. And if you're like me and you get lost all the time, you're like, preach it, brother. But we're lost in all areas. It's kind of like this. Like, hey, what do you want for dinner? Maybe you have this argument. And they say, I don't know. Well, what do you want for dinner? I don't know. Well, what about Mexican food? Mm, no, 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 no. I had that last night. What about pizza? No, nah, I don't know. You're at a loss for what you want for dinner. Many of you are probably there. But then it spills into bigger decisions. Huge decisions like, what college do we want our kid to go to? Do we want our kid to go to college? Well, do we want to have kids? Well, if we want to have kids, what are their names going to be? I don't know. Well, if we're going to have kids, what kind of diaper are they going to wear? Because there's 4,000 diapers. I just don't know. It spills into all these decisions. And then you're like, do my kids go to private school, public school, homeschool? Am I happy with my job? Uh Uh-oh. What do I want to do with the rest of my life? Should I quit? Should I start my own company? Should I go back to school? Should I buy a bigger house? Should I sell when the market's good or when it's bad? What should I do? I just don't know. And then you get the question, do I retire? And you're just like, "Uh, uh, now? I don't know. The truth is this. None of us really know. We none of us really know what's going on. Mm Mm-mm. We need someone to give us direction. Direction in our life, direction in our finances, in our jobs, direction in our families. Every area of our life, Jesus wants to get involved. He does. He wants to get involved. He wants to be part of the decision-making process. Why? Why? Oh, maybe you're thinking, Because he's got a big ego and he wants to make himself look good. No. Mm -mm. Not at all. That's That's not how he works. No. Maybe you're thinking he'll get mad at you if you make the wrong decision. No, not at all. He wants to get involved because he knows best. He knows best. Look at verse four. Verse four. After he gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and then they follow him because they know his voice. He walks ahead of them. It's a lot different than probably what you thought in your head. If I ask you to close your eyes and think about, hey, what does a sheep herder do? And what does he look like? And how does he move the sheep? Many of you probably are thinking like a cowboy and with cattle, like on a cattle drive. Well, here's a question. If you're the cowboy, is the cowboy out front or is he behind the cows on a cattle drive? What's the answer? I can't hear you because you went, you're like a bunch of zombies. He's behind. That's why it's called a cattle drive. He drives them. He gets behind them and he drives them where they want the cows to go. Listen to me. Jesus is not like that. He's not. Mm -mm. He's not going to get behind you. 
He's not breathing down your neck. He's not going to even tell you what to do. Hmm. He's going to go out in front of you. He'll lead the way. Anything he asks you to do, he's willing to do it first. He's going to show you by example. By having the example. And we need to listen for his voice. You got to listen for his voice. We need to be clear about what his voice is telling us to do. Look at verse 6. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained to them, I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. The people listening to Jesus had a hard time getting this. Why? Because they were surrounded by religion. The entire country was based on religion. On every corner in the town, there's somebody trying to lead them. And Jesus is the only one trying to give them true direction. See, you have to understand, he says, he's the gate for the sheep. He's the way for the sheep to go. Maybe you heard this phrase, I'm the truth, the light, the life. The way? See, Jesus is talking about himself. But what does it mean? Second thing I want you to write down is this. When you feel like you're an outcast, Jesus wants to bring you close. When you feel like you're an outcast, he wants to bring you close. So you have to understand at this time, everyone felt like an outcast. And by the way, if you were a shepherd, you're a ceremony unclean. That meant you would likely never be able to go into the temple at all. And the temple is where you go to worship God. And there's always, they're always on the outside looking in. Left out. Wanting to be in there, but they're an outcast. And here's the great thing. Jesus identifies with them. Isn't that awesome? But the thing you have to understand is this. How the religion worked back then. See, they would have a temple be right in the middle of Jerusalem. And they would go to the temple one time a year, and it's called Passover. But the thing you have to understand is this. They would go and they'd offer a sacrifice of a lamb or sheep to be killed. And they'd kill that animal and spill its blood for just you. It would cover your sins. Just you. And if you didn't have a sacrifice, you were left out. And inside the temple, here's some really interesting things. Because you had different rooms, and you had different sections, and you could go to this place, or you could go to that place, only if you were official. If you had the right pedigree, if you had the right job, if you knew the right person, there was only one place. And one person could go to that one place. It was the holy of holies. And it was closed off to everyone except for the high priest. But the thing about the holy of holies, there's a giant curtain that separated the holy of holies from the rest of the temple. And on the day that Jesus died, the Bible says that curtain was ripped in two. And in the temple, the holy of holies was opened up but in heaven, something else greater happened. See, the curtain that separated us from God was removed forever. We now have access through Jesus. Remember, he's the gate. He's the gate. He said, I'm the way. The way to where? To God. The way into the holy of holies. The real holy of holies. Heaven. Heaven. It's kind of like what Hebrews 4, 16 said. We can come boldly to the throne. Hebrews 10, 19. We come boldly into heaven's most holy place. So now, no matter where you are, no matter what you've done or what, you, what you're about to do, you have access to God. You can ask him for anything, any time, any place, any need. You're part of the family. You're in the in crowd. You belong. There's something that religious people did not like. They hated it. They wanted to keep people out. 
They wanted to have a say of who could get in. They, they despised it. And Jesus, what does he call them? Thieves, robbers. Look at verse 8. All who come before me were thieves and robbers. But the true sheep do not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come through me will be saved. Say saved. Saved. They will come and go freely and find good pastures. First ever said find good pastures. Southern accent got me. But pastures, you'll find the goodness in God. You'll find blessing. You'll find that you matter. That is what Jesus promised. That's what he promises to each and every one. Look at verse 10. Verse 10 says the thief promises. This is what he promises to do. Steal, kill, destroy, but my purpose, this is God talking, my purpose is that to give rich and satisfying life. See, the scary news is there's a real enemy out there to get you. His name is Satan. But there's the good news. There's someone else who is better, who's out to save you and me and all of us. And his name is Jesus. So the third thing I want you to write down is this. When you think that you're at a dead end, when you think you're at a dead end, Jesus wants to turn your life around. Many of you in this room, you can identify with that. If you were being honest, you're saying, hey, that's me. See, when you feel like you're spinning your wheels, Jesus has more for you. When you feel like nothing else matters, Jesus has direction for your life. When you feel like you're just lost and left out, he has a place for you. You And when you feel like you've been taken advantage of, when you feel like you've been robbed, and you feel like you don't matter, Jesus has life for you. He does. He's the author of life. He laid down his life so that you could have more life. Look at the last verse. Look at the last verse, verse 11. It says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for the sheep. Literally, that means lay down. That means the shepherd would lay down over the entrance of, of the pen. But Jesus is using it in a different way, saying he lays down, lay down your life to sacrifice, to give your life, to die. That's what Jesus did on the cross for you. And for me, he freely gave so you could freely receive. Real freedom. Real freedom from your past. Real freedom from your sin. Real freedom from your addiction, your depression, your problem. That's what he is offering today, right now. And for those of you, you want to turn your life around, here's what you got to do. It's real simple. The Bible's real clear. If you want to turn your life around, you turn your back on your sin. You say, I'm done with this life, God. I give you my life. I put my eyes on you. Forgive me of my sin. Whatever it is. And I turn my eyes to Jesus. And you do what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says. That means you declare with your mouth. That means you tell God, hey, I believe that Jesus is Lord. I believe, not in my head, Mm -mm. Watch what the scripture says. Your heart, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Because it's by believing in your heart you're going to be made right with God. And openly declaring your faith, you will be saved. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, maybe that's you today You're saying, Rob, that's me. I want to turn from my old life and I want to turn to Jesus and give my life to Jesus. I've never done that. I keep feeling like the enemy's trying to kill, steal, and destroy every step that I have and I'm just done. I give up. Every human solution I try is not working. 
Well, can I just tell you, you're 18 inches from making the best decision of your life. You're 18 inches. Because there's a lot of you here in this room or watching online, you have a lot of head knowledge, but you don't have any heart knowledge. There's nothing in your heart. If I was to read Romans 10, 9, 10 again, you don't have that in your heart. You don't have that belief in your heart. And I want to help you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. This is too big of a decision. This is between you and God. I want to help you though. If that's you and you say, Rob, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to put my faith in Jesus right now. I invite you to pray this prayer. There's nothing magical about this prayer. It's the attitude of the heart that's going to save you. If that's you, you say, Rob, that's me. I want to give my life to Jesus. I invite you to repeat after me. You say, dear God, I admit that I'm a sinner. Forgive me of all of my sin. I believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose to save and rescue me. In the best way that I know how, I turn my back on my old life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving and rescuing me. With every head bowed, every eye closed, if you said that prayer for the very first time, you just gave your life to Christ. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But when I count to three and I want you to look up at me, I just want to celebrate with you. One, two, three. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, will you look up at me? Did you give your life to Jesus? That's awesome. Anyone else? Anyone else? Did you give your life to Jesus? Okay, stay with me, okay? If you're looking up at me, I want you to stay with me. Here's what I need you to do. I want you to reach in and grab that connection card. It's a, it's a green card. They're going to give you some instructions in a minute. You just gave your life to Christ. After the service, I want you to come find me. I'll be down front with a lot of our other staff. I want to just celebrate with you. We helped you find Jesus. Now we want to help you follow Jesus. Do you accept Jesus in your life? That's incredible. Anyone else? If you're like, if you said, Rob, I gave my life to Jesus. I just need you to look up at me. Anybody else? That's incredible. Stay with me, okay? In a few moments, we're going to open up this altar. Some of our staff is going to be down front. Maybe you just need to pray in your seat and say, God, thank you for saving and rescuing me. How can I be a light into a dark world? Maybe you need to come down front and just get on your hands and knees and surrender and say, God, I give this to you. I can't solve this. I need your help. Father, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing here. And in this room and in our kids' rooms as people are surrendering and saying yes to Jesus. God, I know what scripture said. There's a party going off in heaven for people saying, I follow Jesus. Did you give your life to Jesus? That's exciting. What about you? That's incredible. Praise the Lord. That's awesome. It's the best decision you've ever made in your life. Anyone else? So we're going to worship. If you need someone to talk to, if you need prayer, we're going to be down here in the front. So let us sing. Let us worship.